Can any member of Congress say with absolute certainty that they know how the pandemic was caused, whether a lab leak versus natural transmission, given the available evidence? No. Thank you. So if any of my colleagues were to say that they know for certain, without question, that COVID started as a lab leak or as a bioweapon, that's not consistent with the assessment of our intelligence agencies. Is that correct? Yes. And that would be speculation on their part. Um, I think that there are different people in the community that have looked at the set of evidence and have found, uh, have come to different conclusions with varying degrees of confidence. And so it's a very challenging topic. And different people can look at the same set of evidence and, and come to different conclusions. Thank you. So, so to, to say that there is just one certain uh, out, uh, known or outcome is, would be incorrect. I mean, obviously, that's, folks have, That's my view. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, and I think that's exactly, that's my view as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm grateful to have a chance to have a substantive discussion today about how we can help uh, the American public and certainly keep us safe from future pandemics. Um, earlier, uh, the chairman was able to clarify at the start of the hearing that we don't know for sure how the COVID-19 pandemic started, and I think it's really important to reemphasize that point. Uh, none of our intelligence agencies have been able to make a determination with complete certainty about the lab leak theory or the theory that COVID was a natural spillover from animals, and so um, that, that was good to hear from, from the chairman earlier. We should be clear that, about that and stay within the boundaries of what the evidence tells us. Um, we know this has not always been the case in the past um, on, this, on this subcommittee or within the Congress. We've had members in the past publicly stating their beliefs of how the pandemic started without actually any conclusive evidence, which I think is, uh, is, a, is a huge mistake. So to, to say that there is just one certain uh, out, uh, known or outcome is, would be incorrect. I mean, obviously that's, folks- have, That's my view. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, and I think that's exactly, that's my view as well. So I wanna thank you for clarifying again. Now, um, and this was just also referenced by the chair, so I wanna just be clear. I know that in July we'd had a, an entire hearing um, where my colleagues had accused, had accused Dr. Fauci, um, or that Dr. Fauci had persuaded the authors of a key research paper to change their conclusions and cover up evidence that the pandemic had emerged from a lab. Um, there were obviously very serious accusations, and, and we called several of the paper's authors to Washington to answer questions uh, about Dr. Fauci's involvement. And both in this room, under oath, and in the documents and written testimony provided to the committee, the people directly involved all told us that the allegations were simply incorrect. So I just wanna repeat that, because hopefully now we can put to rest any allegations that we know for certain how the pandemic started at this point. Um, uh, just also a quick question for both of our witnesses. Um, why is it important to strengthen biosafety and biosecurity standards universally, respective of where, the, where a potential pandemic causing pathogen uh, may emerge? I'll start. Um, so I think, as I noted in my testimony, um, we're really only as strong as our weakest link. So, uh, you know, a pandemic that's caused uh, either through a deliberate bioweapons attack or through an accidental release could emerge anywhere in the world. And um, infectious diseases, no matter what their origin, don't respect borders. And as we saw with the COVID pandemic, um, an outbreak that can happen in one part of the world if it's not quickly, rapidly contained, can quickly spread globally, um, causing uh, vast um, human casualties, uh, political disruption, and extensive economic damage. And so if we really want um, to prevent those kinds of events in the future, it's critical to invest in biosafety and biosecurity as a preventative measure as part of a broader layer defense that is complementary to efforts, so to broader biodefense efforts to detect and rapidly respond. Those are all critical. Thank you. And I agree with my colleague um, 100 percent, you know, and, and really we know enough already that we must take action um, at the animal, human, environmental interface, nexus, whether that's in nature, whether that's in a laboratory, you know, inaction really is not an option. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add, you know, I'm also just grateful that the Biden administration has taken important steps to prioritize biosafety and biosecurity promote strong biosafety standards and make sound investments in bio risk management, uh, disease surveillance and safe and responsible research. As you both mentioned, uh, we, we have there's still a lot of work to be done, which you've mentioned throughout, um, throughout this hearing today. Um, both of you also, also specifically mentioned the need for additional funding and investment in these efforts. Uh, Democrats in Congress and President Biden agree with you. Now, earlier this year, the president requested Congress appropriate $6.1 billion for the CDC 
to enhance domestic and global disease surveillance, biosafety, and biosecurity efforts. I know that um, if we had a Speaker of the House, we could actually vote uh, to advance some of that funding, and hopefully we'll get there soon. Uh, Democrats in Congress are ready to get to work, but we're, of course, here listening to this important work, not able to move forward because the House is still in a standstill. So hopefully that will end uh, very shortly. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back.